Hello and welcome to LED Live. If you're new here, please subscribe by clicking that red button down below. Uh, we're on the road to 100K, almost halfway there, so we'd really like your support. And if you're a reoccurring uh, subscriber who comes on every Friday, tunes in to join into the discussion, we appreciate you and thank you so much. Uh, I've been gone for a while, and <laughs> it's good to be back. Welcome back. Uh, it's good to have a job still. Thank you, guys. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, listen, we're going to be discussing uh, faith today. Have you ever battled with or wrestled with your own Christian faith? What happens when a very influential person is battling with their faith? Find out on this episode of LED Live. Light exposing darkness. So things are going to be a little bit different in this episode. Today we're going to focus more on apologetics. Mm -hmm. And for those who don't know, apologetics is um, speaking in defense of something, usually having to deal with uh, religion or religious doctrines. So I'm going to have you guys help me give a response to someone like Marty Sampson or anyone really who's struggling with their own Christian faith. Yeah, I mean, it, this is not somebody that's just like way obscure, right? right. I mean, this is a very high profile person mm -hmm. that is literally like questioning his belief system right now. Yeah, a lot of influence, a lot of reach, and has been doing this for a really long time. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about that phrase, Christian faith. What does it mean to be a Christian? Follower well, of Christ. Yeah, obviously you believe in Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible is a, uh, as an account of uh, God's word to us, and that's kind of how we understand the context of what's going on in the world right now. Mm. I like how you kept it basic, you know, just a follower of Christ. That's, mm. that's the foundation of it all. All of these things used to be the beliefs of Marty Sampson, uh, but things have since changed. Marty Sampson is a songwriter for a popular evangelical Christian band called Hillsong United, and he's announced that he's genuinely losing his faith. And this happened just a few weeks after evangelical author Joshua Harris announced that he no longer calls himself a Christian. Have you guys heard of Joshua Harris before? Yeah, I actually, I think I've read a couple of his books. Yeah. I've heard of Joshua yeah. Harris. I've kissed he, he Dating wrote, Goodbye. Yeah, I kissed yeah. Dating Goodbye, I've yeah. read that one. Mm -hmm. That really changed culture, Christian yeah. youth culture. Right, you know, I mean, he, he was coming at that from, you know, having having good Christian values in your dating system and... Is he saying he's straight up atheist or is he just questioning well, and doesn't know? He's not a Christian. He's just rejected Renounced Christianity it. altogether. Didn't so, you, you, yeah. you know what's interesting to me about that is because I try to think of, put myself in that position. It's like knowing what I know now and what I believe now, mm -hmm. I, I, I can't make my mind not believe that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like how do you get to the place that you're all of a sudden like, I'm gonna just set this aside and it's like not real, you right. know, like. Well, that's what we're gonna discuss in this episode. So let's just try to understand where these people are coming from. Yeah, I can identify. I was once agnostic extremely. I was raised in a Christian home, but Christians didn't have good answers. That's mm. kind of my mission in life is like, I wanna have answers for the skeptics because this generation is very skeptical and a lot of kids are not, they're just not even given Christianity a chance. I feel like if I would have got to, if I would have been exposed to some of the people that I know about now, uh, that have the, you know these apologetics, uh, it might have helped me see the truth a lot earlier than I did. Mm. Now, this isn't something that happens overnight. I mean, um, Marty joined the band Hillsong when he was 16 years old. Mm. He's been in ministry for more than half of his life. When Marty took to social media, the decline was quite rapid. Um, he went from I'm struggling to I'm done in a matter of weeks. Mm, wow. So here's the post. Time for some real talk. I'm genuinely losing my faith. And it doesn't bother me. Like, what bothers me now is nothing. Now, I read something like that and I see someone who's just, first of all, has been struggling for a really long time. And now they're kind of like breaking out of the silence and saying, yeah, now I'm ready. Now I'm, I'm really ready to talk and hopefully maybe receive some counsels and some answers because maybe it hasn't been working the way I've been doing it before. But then when I read, I'm genu genuinely losing my faith and it doesn't bother me. That sounds like someone who's numb, who's just yeah. like completely done, Not given up. Yeah, I, I, would, I would 
even venture to say this is probably not something that just happened in a few weeks. Right. This is something that was brewing under the surface. He probably said nothing. And you know, in in the in the public eye, uh, especially as a singer and a you know a performer, you are probably taxed to the to the limit. And you know, if you're not spending that daily time connecting yourself with God, all of this can be just going through the motions. And you know, this is just sort of the iceberg. I'm sure. Exactly. To be wrestling for this long and reach a breaking point. That's right. And then to just be like, you know, then, it, it is what it is. And it's you don't even feel me. bad about it. Yeah. 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 That's that's a little alarming. So have any of you ever struggled in your own Christian walk? I don't know if you've gotten to this point. Um, I don't think I've ever actually struggled in the point where I came to a place where I said there is no God. Even when I went way out into the world, I think, you know, I, if you would have asked me questions about God, I would have answered them. Um, just didn't have an application for it in my life. So I actually don't know what that's like to even be in a place that it's like, I'm questioning even the existence of. I, I don't know what that's like. Yeah, I, w I would say the same. There's never been a time in my life where I've gotten to that point. I have been there, but like I said, it was, it was Christians didn't have good answers, you know? Like, it, it took me trying everything else and finding out that all of it's just empty, you know? Like, like Solomon said, it's vanity, vanity. Like I did witchcraft and all this stuff and it's just like all of it left me hopeless and empty and then finally like at, when I was at rock bottom my cousins like just showed up at the right time and said dude this is what I've been seeing in the Bible it's real to me all the answers are in here and it was somebody I looked up to my parents had been trying to show me this is true but to me oh you're just my parents you're just old or whatever but my cousin who I looked up to showing it to me in a real way like dude this is real I was like, all right, let me try it. And after reading it for myself, not just taking the words from behind a pulpit, like digging in, that's when God started to reveal himself to me. And that's when Jesus says, seek and you'll find, knock and I'll answer. Like, you have to have that type of desire. I, I see atheists all the time. I've read the Bible cover to cover. It doesn't mean anything. Well, because you're looking at it, trying to debunk it or something. You're not seeking with an open, honest heart. And I think when God knows you're truly seeking, He'll reveal Himself in a way personal to you that nobody else can deny. And I, you know, I wonder if this guy is seeking for that type of experience. Or I, I, I think I can understand it as well. On the, you know, we analyze Hollywood movies, and we're able to like all of a sudden pick something out. And people are always like, "What? How did you see that? I did not see that." Right? When when you are 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 opening your eyes and you're looking for, for a, a, a particular something, two people can have a two totally different experiences looking at the exact same thing. And um, from, from our perspective, even in the Hollywood scene, it's like we have this sort of big picture understanding so we're able to see how this like micro, you know, thing that we're dealing with in life deals in this big picture type of a thing. And so some of these guys, um, you know, especially agnostics, if they're reading the Bible, it's like they don't have this grand view of it. They're just literally looking at the text in this like little tiny way. And to them, it could just be, this is poetry, you know, it's, it doesn't right. make sense. Before I personally read Marty's post, I was very skeptical. In my experience, um, back at home, when people would come to me saying, oh, so-and-so, you know, has uh, left the church, but they made it seem like the person left God, which was really not the case. There's a difference between leaving the church, like the building, the fellowship, the congregation, and leaving God. Um, so I was saying, man, people are really blowing this out of proportion. He probably just had a falling out in the band, but he hasn't really left God. Um, but later I came to find out that he is, it seems like he's on both sides. Not only has he left the band, but he's also having some serious questions or had some serious questions about God to the point where he's left the faith completely. So um, I just like to go through his post and see where he's coming from, the questions that he, he's had, um, and see if we can offer some answers. Uh, because unfortunately he didn't post uh, anything after that. He just kind of left it open-ended. So maybe we can be of help to someone out there who is searching. Marty posted all of this on Instagram and later deleted it, but not before someone could screen capture it. So that's good. We, that's have, the, wow. we have the post. This is a soapbox moment, so here I go. How many preachers fall? Many. No one talks about it. Now, that particular point is interesting because 
um, when preachers fall, it's actually a pretty big deal. Like it's all <laughs> over the place. People right. are like, oh, I can't believe it. It's over the media and things. So I really wonder what, like what angle he's coming from when he says no one talks about it. Right. And, and usually when the shepherd kind of like gets gets kicked, you know, it scatters mm -hmm. their sheep. And there's a big discussion around it as well. Right. So. Maybe he's not talking about in the notable preachers. In the you know, okay. Maybe he comes across people through the music ministry of Hillsong or their travels or whatever you want to call it. And they encounter people who have, you know, been leading out in churches and they're just like, I'm, I'm done. Mm. I kind of wonder if when preachers struggle, who do they talk to? Mm. That's probably a bad situation. I mean, I'm a pastor and I'm struggling. Who do I even go to? I'm supposed to be preaching to this congregation. Especially if you're a lead pastor. Like, I can see this in the, the non-denominational scene. If you set up your own church and you're the lead dog, like, who do you go to? Mm. You know, if you're under that hierarchy, you probably go to the top guy. If you're under some denominational structure, there's somebody you know, above you, unless you are the guy at the top, you know, mm. you're the, uh, the president or the Pope or whatever you are, <laughs> like, you know, can you imagine like the Pope needs to count? Oh, <laughs> man. Go talk to you. <laughs> yeah. And how many preachers follow? Many. Okay, good. It, it shows that everyone is redeemable. I mean, that's what's so great about the Bible characters, you know, it, these aren't picture perfect stained glass people that we could never reach up to. They've, they've fallen and it just kind of shows nobody's like perfect and we're all redeemable I mean, that's a good thing that's a good point i mean you also um, want to look at preachers and pastors um, typically especially if they're in the public eye like this people put them on a pedestal wow this person is so amazing they do all these amazing things but we're all really in the same boat you know struggling through this thing called sin and uh you know they're they're dealing with it just like we're dealing with it and i don't believe that we should hold up on a pedestal anybody else because when they do fall then everybody's like paying attention to them and then they you know yeah. go where they go so you know you, pastors need prayer just like everyone else how many miracles happen not many no one talks about it okay that, you want to pause there hey we should sure. talk about it because we just go miracles past it. happen <laughs> this might be a long led guys <laughs> mm. i guess it, it probably depends on what you define as a miracle, as a miracle. Yeah. that's know, a good question people are going to define miracles in different ways if he's talking about the kind of miracles we read about in the Bible, do we see a lot of those here in the U.S.? Yeah, probably not. I don't know about other parts of the world because I don't live there. Yeah, very true. But other types of miracles, I mean, there's all kinds of things that happen. People every day probably call little miracles. My so. overnight freedom from addiction was a supernatural miracle. Mm. I mean, that probably had the same thing, right? Yeah. Well, a miracle is a shift in the natural order of things. Yeah, I mean, in, in the case of drugs, if chemical. you have a chemical dependency, I mm. mean, you're you're headed down that road, and if, if you know, God takes that away from you, I especially over that miracle. Yeah, right. every day that I, that I try to say I'm not gonna do it in my own strength, irritable without weed, nauseous without alcohol. I prayed to God and told him, I cannot do it in my own strength, I'm surrendering to you. You gotta take it from me, and you know, I'm giving you permission. Woke up the next day, and none of those effects. I mean, gone. And, and then it became a constant dependency on Christ. It wasn't like it was done, like the tempter's always there. So now you're pumping gas and the glowing beer signs in your face. Lord, give me the strength not to go in there and, and, and get a beer. And, you, and you're driving home without a brown bag, and you get to experience victory every day. But like I'm saying, the withdrawals and things, that's a supernatural event. And then you get to become dependent on Christ, which is a good thing, I think. Why is the Bible full of contradictions? No one talks about it. So I took a class this summer on hermeneutics. That was one of the things that came up is discrepancies, if you will, in the Bible. And so it's, it's almost always little, little things. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes it's like numbers, you know, there's an example. I forget it's either in like 1 Corinthians 10 or 11. Paul is talking about a number of people that fell in the wilderness. The number that he mentions in the New Testament is about a thousand people different than what's actually mentioned in the Old Testament. And so people look at that and like, okay, wait a minute, these numbers don't match, like what's going on here? We do the same thing all the time, right? We'll try to recall something from memory. It's not like Paul was like toting around like scrolls all the time and like yeah. sitting referencing. Yeah. These things are huge and you're having to roll them out, yeah. you know? What people have to understand is the way that the Bible defines error 
is deception, right? Mm. And so these little things that we find in the Bible is not purposefully trying to deceive people, nor does it change the intention of the the story or the right. or the, the context or that the we're reading. Point. The main point. It doesn't detract from the main point. So if Paul says, you know, twenty two thousand people fell in the wilderness and you go to numbers and it says twenty three, well the point is people fell in the wilderness because yeah. they right. sinned against right. God and God pronounced a judgment. Yeah. So yeah, I can see where people see what seem to be contradictions in the Bible, but the core message, like what what's being taught in the Bible is is true it doesn't change and you know so yeah i wish there were some specific examples given yeah, because yeah, there's not he's vague it's kind of easy to throw mud and all of a sudden it's like you know you're not really dealing with it but you're kind of just casting that little tiny seed of doubt for sure and so you can see his doubt actually coming through and just the way he's even mentioning this because if you really had a discrepancy over that verse and that problem, you would bring that up and be like, hey, how can we reconcile this? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's not gonna change my belief in God, but to kind of make a blanket statement, like there's contradictions in the Bible, therefore I lost my religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've actually been in situations like that. And usually just to see where the person is coming from, I would ask the question, okay, name one. You know, what's a contradiction oh, yeah, that, right. that, that, right. <laughs> that you've encountered? And one of two things will happen. They'll say, oh, you know, I don't know. And then I would know, okay, this person is just regurgitating maybe yeah, some information, exactly. using right. it as an excuse to not study the Bible That's or right. to just toss their faith. But if they do present a contradiction, I get excited because I'm like, okay, let's let's hash this out, let's discuss it. And I realize there's, there's three main categories that contradictions fall into, and you named one of them. One is numbers, the other one is the message, and the last one is events. And so I've actually, I had some um, examples of contradictions, oh, supposed okay. contradictions Makes it that I'd like to share with you guys right. cool. and hear your it. responses. No pressure, no pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, let's have some fun. Let's see. So first cat category, numbers. Mm -hmm. In the books of Mark and Luke, it is stated that two blind men were healed by Jesus. However, in Matthew, it says that one blind man was healed in Jericho. Contradiction? So uh, I would just first say that Jesus actually probably healed lots of people because when you went through the villages, I mean, there was literally not one sick person in those villages. I mean, that's, that's certain, certain experiences that the, the, the disciples had. I mean, if you saw, how many people live in a village? A thousand, you know what I mean? If you saw a ton of people like this all the time being healed and you're trying to remember this detail, not to mention how many years later was it actually written down? I would have to totally agree with Keith once again. How does that detract from the fact that Jesus healed if there's literally examples of him healing thousands of other people and yet there's like, there's like, you know, okay, he did one or he did two or he healed the left eye, not the right <laughs> eye. Mm -hmm. To me, that still doesn't take away from, from the uh, absolute craziness that, that that's really what Jesus spent his time doing yeah. more than anything else. He was healing people. The intention of the Bible writer is not to deceive people. so. Um, you mentioned it was Mark and Luke? Yes. Okay, so Mark. Mark and Luke, we know, were not um, first-hand witnesses of the events in Jesus' life. So when they're writing, they're getting their information from other people. Who were witnesses. Who were witnesses. Mm -hmm. So um, oftentimes, eyewitness accounts are not even considered reliable in court because people's memories have a tendency to fail. Not everybody is a detail person either. So, you know, Matthew, he's there. He could have remembered wrong. There might have been two. He might have only seen one. It probably depends on where he was standing. I mean, who, there's all kinds of variables. But the point is, the, the purpose of the passage is not to deceive people on how many people were healed. The point is, people were healed. Men received their sight, you know. and. And how often does that happen? You know, that was that was a big deal back then. Like, there's even a question in the Bible where it's like, how, you know, has it ever been heard that a man's sight has been restored? You know, when, when have you ever heard of that happening? Mm -hmm. And here it happens in front of them. Yeah. I, I think that um, if you had, let's say, um, there was two guys and one was gonna go and tell the king something 
and the other one was going to do something big and prominent and, and, and then the count was different and so the outcome of their, their action would have been different based on the story. That would totally change the context of would that be an important number to remember. If there was really nothing that was going to happen after that, I really don't see that that, that would uh, raise question marks in my mind. Yeah, what I think happened is whoever wrote one, somebody saw Jesus heal somebody and was like, Jesus just healed somebody. Okay, I'm going to write it down. Yeah. And somebody else said, Jesus just healed two people. All right, this guy wrote two people. Yeah, I mean. They're talking to somebody else about it while the other guy's getting yeah. healed. I mean, there's all kinds of scenarios. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know how people play telephone. You know, this guy tells this but guy, this guy. and yeah. before, It's yeah. nothing to say, okay, toss the whole Bible out because one, one guy got healed or two guys got healed. I right. mean, that's, that's ludicrous. Yeah. And I'll, I'm going to go back to what Mikey said. If you're looking for a reason to doubt, mm -hmm. there's You'll find enough, it. yeah, there's Plenty. enough information there for you to go, well, this doesn't make any sense to me, so then therefore I'm going to reject the whole thing. It's certainly not a contradiction to Jesus' divinity and claims to be the Son of God. I mean, after all, he is healing people yeah. in that context. So you can't look at it and say, well, Jesus obviously isn't the Son of God because he was healing one guy, not two. I mean, that's... The next one, message. You ready for this? Okay. In the Old Testament, it says an eye for an eye. But in the New Testament, it teaches differently. In the Sermon of the Mount, or in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, turn the other cheek. Contradiction? <laughs> that's, a, that's a more tough one. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a more tough one. That is. No, so, I mean, like, which one what, is it? Which one what is believe? the purpose of what Jesus is doing on the Sermon on the Mount? That's the question, yeah. because that helps clarify what's going on here. Is Jesus saying, well, you've heard it said this way, so now throw that out. No. Jesus is taking the Old Testament and he's saying, let's put everything in its proper context. Let's put everything in its proper meaning. Let me expound to you the details of what all this means because you've gone through years of this teaching and it's become kind of humdrum, if you will. It's been taught this way and so you've only understood it one way this whole time. Now let me like really open it up for you. So it's not a contradiction, it's Jesus saying no, I, after all, you know, the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion, right? So Jesus wouldn't come from God to contradict what God had said, right? Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit would not have inspired one writer to say this and then, you know, inspired Jesus to say, no, so I mean, absolutely not. I mean, that's, yeah. it's completely ludicrous, right? So, so let's, put it, let's put it in a modern setting. You know, you have every right to get a divorce if your spouse cheats on you, right? So kind of what I see Jesus saying in this setting is he's saying like, you have the right to divorce your wife, but I'm gonna tell you, let's ask for forgiveness. You have that right, but let's ask for forgiveness and let's look past what your right is and let's be higher than that. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Just exactly. out of curiosity. Yeah, he's, not, he's not throwing it away. He's, not he's literally saying, you know, that, 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 that's right. You know, if someone knocks your tooth out, I mean, you should be able to knock their tooth out. Right. But the better option here would be, don't get into a fight. Be the bigger person and don't, don't engage in that. Love that person. So he's widening the tunnel view. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, last one, number three, events. Okay. In Genesis 1 verse 27, it says that man and woman were made together. But in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, it says they were made separate and woman was brought to man. Well, which one is it? Contradiction? So if you make, um, if you make, some, if you make some spaghetti and some bread on the same day, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you made a meal and you made these things together. I, that to me is like not specifying, uh, you know, like like there was this whole separate event or they were supposed to be made at the exact same simultaneous time. But you also have to understand a little bit about the Jewish writing. They told you the punchline first, then mm. they went back and showed you detail. Mm. So where we in the English language, we would typically write in big picture and then drill down as you get f closer to the to the end of the chapter. So to me, it's like, there was a statement that was made, God made both of these, and then later on, he's telling how he made well, them. Well, it's actually reversed, Absolutely. I think. So what's, right. what's the problem again that they're saying? Because <laughs> I don't see a problem. But really, it's just um, yeah, the full yeah, picture in chapter yeah. one and the detail in chapter two. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. I'd, I'd love to see an atheist, like, uh, allow us to have an argument like that with them, <laughs> you know? They'd be like, are you kidding me? Right, yeah. 
Yeah, so okay. these, these things are, are quite small, kind Straw of man. fall apart. But just as the Bible can can defend itself, can stand on its own, hold its own weight for those small things, it could do the same for the big ones as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think those things get amplified when you start having doubts. You know, that's that's the problem is when you're looking for a reason to doubt, then you're gonna find something latch onto it and make a bigger deal out of it. So so I would almost suggest that if you know, somebody that's listening to this LED is having doubts and maybe agrees with some of those doubts. Um, if you actually take a step back, don't drill in so in fine detail and nitpick, okay, he said this word and he did this. Look at the big picture of Christianity. What's the overarching goal of Christianity? How is my life bettered if I adhere to these, these goals? And, and, and sort of just, you know, it's okay to take a step back and sort of analyze it from a, from a big picture. I, I think if you're like finally looking for a sentence in this 2,000 page book that, that is gonna, you know, give you the answer that you're out, you know, you're, you're setting yourself up for that. Um, so just take a step back and take a breather and, and think about Christianity as a whole. I like what um, Ken Ham says. Uh, he said this in response to Marty actually. When Bible passages are properly understood, there are no contradictions. This situation, talking about Marty's situation, about this person, is a reminder the church and parents need to teach apologetics to counter today's attacks on Amen. God's word. Amen. There you go. So um, this is this really struck home because I remember um, growing up in the church, we were really active in the community as a youth group. We would go and paint the the uh, the park and mm -hmm. you know feed the homeless and do all these things, but we never had Bible study. Mm. like in the church mm. like we never came together as young people um and just opened the bible and studied it and mm. it made me wonder you know do the people in the church really know what the youth believe mm -hmm. and how quickly can someone end up like marty sampson right and if you're not kind of giving them the tools to be able to to um handle and 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 understand when people have questions you know those questions can sit in the mind and plant a seed and then you know choke out the truth mm -hmm. and so i th i think that's a very wise advice to teach apologetics and learn how to handle it when somebody has a doubt and they come at you with a doubt you know yeah how do you, question you i used to go to the youth pastor after the sermon and ask him why is this why is that and he would say some things we just won't know till we get to heaven. I mean, what kind of cop out is that, dude? Mm. I mean, it was when I got later in life and I saw people like Kent Hovind defend uh, creationism and Walter Weith and these people like it made perfect, clear, scientifically accurate evidence, like debunking theories like Darwinian evolution with science. Like people need to see that kind of stuff, or else they're just gonna think Christians believe a bunch of fairy tales. How can God be love, yet send four billion people to a place all because they don't believe? No one talks about it. Now that raised a lot of questions Ooh. in my mind. First yeah. off, where did he get the number, four billion? And I can assume he's talking about hell, the that's, place that's where the they hot don't topic believe. right there. <laughs> I know where he got the number four billion. He watched the um, Marvel Endgame. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Explain. Half of the world gets destroyed by Thanos. I think where it comes in is Let's see, Catholicism represents about how many people? About a billion? I don't know. And Christianity collectively beyond that is probably somewhere approaching that number. So that's about your two billion, I think. And then the rest of the world is this, you know, Hindu, Buddhist, Islam, whatever. I'm, I'm guessing that's probably close to where that well, number's coming from. That's all we can do, guess. He doesn't really yeah. give us much. He doesn't specify, it's vague. <laughs> but, I, but I also think that, um, once again, you have to understand how God is making that judgment. We call him the righteous judge because he's able to judge based on somebody's life. So if you basically get to the point where you are, are, are not wanting to go to heaven, God's not gonna force you to go to heaven. That's why I love the saying, only those that want to go to heaven will be in heaven. I mean, if you were going to be miserable, God in his mercy would not put you there in a place that you would be miserable. That's and true. so, you know, I think that at the end of the judgment, that's why every tongue will profess, every knee will bow, everyone, even down to Satan and his angels, say, God, you were right, we were wrong, you've judged righteously, and we don't deserve to be in, ever, in, an, in your everlasting kingdom. So. You have to understand the concept of, or the context of how God is saying this to make that decision. If you just look at it on its surface, just like you would Thanos, 
just destroying half of humanity just because there's no reason, that looks unmerciful. Mm -hmm. But it actually is completely merciful when you look at the context of how God is doing that. Yeah, God is, God is pursuing humanity, you know, and when he says God is love, yet they're sending them place because they don't believe. God is not sending anybody anywhere because they don't believe. God is making a judgment call based on your response to him. And if your response is rejection, I don't want you, yeah. then God says, you can have what you want. Yeah. yeah. So it's putting like it the back on the person. You're putting it back on the, the person. Yeah. They're the ones making the decision. And I think that's why everybody is, if you want to be a Satanist and follow Satan, God lets you do that. Yeah. To me, that's awesome. I want to serve that kind of God. If you're yeah. going to let me do that, and he lets Satan literally um, fight against him and drag a bunch of the other angels. God did not force those other angels to go you know, on Satan's side. They could no longer abide together in heaven when they didn't abide by heaven's rules. Mm -hmm. And God just said, hey, you're, you're causing discord. You need to go. Yeah. And um, um, so that, that, that's, that's what I see. Yeah, yeah the, the free will that he allows is the very definition of love. The fact that he didn't destroy Satan on the spot displays that love. Um, if he would have destroyed Satan right then, imagine the thoughts that would have been going through all the watching angels' minds like, wow, okay, don't ever go outside the box because you will be destroyed. And then their, their motivation for worship would be fear-based. So we're worshiping because if we don't, you'll just destroy us. That's not really the way it is. God is giving you a gift. I want you to have this life. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. But look what look at the world. Look at a time lapse of the world and see where we're at now and how many people are just openly rejecting him and they're gonna be the ones to say, Oh well, he's just gonna send me someplace because it's, I don't believe like you hate him and you hate his people. It's kind of an interesting argument. If you were to play it out in your head and like say the words, Okay, you know, here's like this person they don't believe in. I don't believe in you, God. If God were to answer, okay. I'm angry you won't let me go to heaven. And God's response, what heaven? You don't believe in me. Mm -hmm. How wow. can there be a heaven for you to be upset that you don't get to go to? Yeah. Right. I mean, right. Yeah. No. I mean that's kind that's of good, the ridiculousness that's a, that's a, that's a of, really the, good point. of the you know conversation if it, if it were to play it out. So, that's right. That's right. I don't know. Let's see, Christians, Christians can be the most judgmental people on the planet. This is, this is true, uh, they can be. They can also be some of the most beautiful and loving people. This is also true. And this is true of secular people as well. Yeah. Yeah. They can be I mean, very judgmental is, and they can be, that's a people. human condition. This is, but it's not for me. I am not in anymore. I want genuine truth. Not just the I believe it kind of truth. Should we keep going? Science keeps piercing the truth of every religion. Lots of things help people change their lives, not just one version of God. Got so much more to say, but for me, I keeping it real. I guess he meant something else. Unfollow if you want. I've never been about living my life for others. All I know is what's true to me right now, and Christianity just seems to be, to me, like another religion at this point. I could go on, but I won't. Okay, Love. Let's, let's pause right there. Okay. Um, Scotty, I remember you saying something about that when he said, um, I've never been about living my life for others. Do you remember? Yes. Yeah. yeah. When we started kind of chatting about this um, before we came on here, that's a very interesting concept because the entire way of Christianity is others focused. You know what I mean? So the fact that you're kind of even mentioning, uh, I'm, I've not been about living about other people. I'm, I'm, I'm literally doing this for myself. I understand he might be talking about the concept of like, it's not influencing making his decisions. So I, I don't want to like totally put it on him that he's not being others focused. Um, but it's kind of an interesting, interesting statement. Um, I like science keeps piercing, uh, science keeps piercing the truth of every religion. I wonder what religions and I wonder what science, but what I've seen when I started looking at it, science keeps proving the Bible over and over. The skeptics doubted that Babylon existed and they excavated excavated the walls of Babylon, like boom, there it is, with the name Nebuchadnezzar on the bricks. 
Um, they over cy- and over, we just Cyprus keep scor- it. Scroll, which proved the book of Daniel, you know, yeah. people were like, oh, this is just some book that's made up, and yet we find and discover a piece of, of history that proves it. So, yeah, I would question what science is he looking at. What's interesting to me is he goes from this, I want genuine truth, not the just, I just believe it kind of truth, and then from there he, he starts listing a whole bunch of things. But you know, the implication is that uh, he's not getting genuine truth in Christianity. And, you know, these are, these are like the reasons why a- after this, you know, uh, lots of things help people change their lives, not just one version of God, you know, um, science, et cetera, et cetera. I guess my question would be is, if you want genuine truth in Christianity and you're not finding it, what are you reading? What are you watching? What are you studying? Who are you hanging out with? Um, you know, what we put into our mind greatly affects what we think. If you spend all day, not to say that he is, but I'm just using this as an example, if you spend all day reading books on evolution, humanism, uh, you know, atheism, you're likely going to be greatly influenced to be of the same mindset because that's what you're taking in so I see a lot of I see a lot of you know frustration here it's it's almost like okay I'm gonna look at what's going on around me in Christianity Uh, yeah I've looked at the Bible don't see any of that in here so okay see you guys checking out and you know it's like we're all on this walk and journey to be like Jesus if we're a genuine Christian and to give up and say, well, nobody here is like Jesus. Um, you all are too much of a screw up. You know, guess I'm gonna go look for something else. Well, I mean, if you look at Revelation chapter three, which is, you know, talking about uh, the different churches, you can understand that. Um, some people understand this differently, but understand it and talking about periods of history. You look at the last church, it says that this is like the most screwed up church basically out of all of them right they're rich they're increased with goods they don't need anything right um, yet they're naked yeah and they're blind you might say this is the church of the hypocrites right and but god says it's it, it's still my church and yes it's going to be messed up don't don't go into it expecting that it's going to be perfect. People come into Christianity oftentimes thinking these people should all be perfect. I mean, they're so so good that like, why aren't they in heaven right now, right? We're all still human. We so all literally, still stuff. his observation is proving but the prophecy know, true, right? But you know what's awesome? What does Jesus end that with? Buy of me. Yeah, he t- he, he has a, a remedy. Yeah, he has a remedy for our sickness, and so you know that remedy is only found in Jesus. So if we're all messed up and he's recognizing that we're messed up, really the antidote to our messed upness is Jesus. Yeah. Instead not, of checking not, out. Not yeah, not getting not out, a rejection not injecting yourself from the game or whatever it is. Right. Go back to Jesus. Show you know, us how to be a immerse real Christian. Immerse yourself dude. in Christ. Immerse yourself in his word. Discover him in his word. I mean that's how you're gonna do it. Yeah. Right? And I think God is a God that is like, test me. Go yeah. ahead. You know uh, if you've got questions and, and doubts, bring them to me. Bring them to my to my foot of my cross, and I will show you who I am. If you ask God that, show me who you are. He's not going to ignore you. Mm-hmm. But when you hold your hand up and you go, you know what? I'm going to try it without him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's like if I come into Christianity, I say, okay, well, this whole thing is not true, not authentic, because look at all these people. Yeah. Well. So what about all those people? What has it done for you in your life? Like, is it changing you? Are you having an experience with Christ? Are you walking with him? Because if you're walking with him, good. You know, now you can influence other people. But if you just look around and kind of throw your hands up and say, well, this didn't work. You know, it's yeah. kind of a, almost like a cop out. Yeah, this guy probably wouldn't like it if somebody judged him by what his bandmates were doing. Yet he's judging God by what his followers are doing. That's a good point. Yeah. 
Well, after emphasizing that he's truly seeking um, answers, mm -hmm. uh, Samson admitted that he's struggling with many parts of uh, the belief system uh, that seems so incoherent with common human uh, morality. Okay. If most of humankind had a choice, would we not rid the world of the scourge of cancer or sickness and disease? Why doesn't God do such a thing? Of course, there is an answer to this question, but the majority of a typical Christian's life is not spent considering these things. Questions such as these remain in the too hard basket. All right, well, let's consider it. Let's try to answer that question. Why doesn't God do something about sickness and disease? Suffering. So I, I would almost kind of even back out a little bit more. What's the purpose of sickness and disease? Sin, right? I mean, sin entered into the world, things start dying, everybody's bodies are degenerating, right? So why doesn't God just solve the sin problem right now? Because he has to allow the freedom, that's, that's, the, that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a God that is literally giving the other side, the opposition to his government, a chance to have a voice mm -hmm. and say, listen, if you think that running the show your way outside of God's Ten Commandments is going to be good for humanity, then I will lay you before kings and they can see that your ways and I will let you exhaust every question. And so at the end of the world, when everybody's dying, I, I think it's just interesting that everybody wants to point their finger at God and be like, yeah. why aren't you solving this right now? Because God is allowing Satan to have his voice yeah. and allow him to play this out. And that would not be fair if all of a sudden, if you serve God, your life's just gonna be peachy and you're never gonna have any problems and you're gonna be rich and you're gonna be this, right? Are you kidding me? Every human being would sign up for God in a heartbeat. So that's not that's not fair. No. You know? Also you gotta you gotta kind of ask where is this cancer, sickness, and disease coming from? Not to go completely down a conspiracy theory train, but when you look at the chemicals in our food, water, air, it's like I eat Doritos every day, why do I have cancer? You know, like we don't do the best for our own health. How are we gonna blame God that well, I ate junk food all the time, I have cancer. So you bring up a, an interesting point, which I, I strongly believe in. You can find it in Galatians 6, I think it's verse 5. I'm paraphrasing, it says, you know, whatever a man sows, he reaps. It'll say it differently in different versions, but basically, you know, the end point, you reap what you sow. That's a biblical principle. And so we see that played out in humanity from the very beginning. You know, the Edenic pair were warned, look, if you do this, there's going to be consequences that follow. Well, we did it. And there are consequences that have followed. And some people think, well, it's not fair that everybody should have to suffer for that choice. But if you think about it, you are born and you get into life and you have your own choices to make. And do you always make the right choices in every circumstance, in every situation? You know, are we all that different from them? You know, here they, they, they were, um, they were perfect, you know, perfect minds, perfect bodies, perfect reasoning capability, but they were also deceived, right? Deceived. And, you know, when deception is a, is a powerful thing, now they have to make a choice. I always kind of, I was kind of put it like this. When Eve is in the garden, and, and she's listening to what the serpent is, is telling her. She'd never been lied to. Mm. In fact, think about it, what's a lie? Yeah. Wow. Never heard what's a lie? It. You know, you've never heard a lie. Now you're presented with two completely different pieces of information. You know what God said, and then this one says something over here, and you have to make a choice and discern between those two. Who do you trust? Yeah. You know, she trusted the wrong one. She didn't trust the one that loved her and made her and had taken care of her so far. She trusted somebody that was bringing her some other information. Then there's also, you know, why is there starvation, all this stuff. There are people on the, there are people on earth that have enough money to fix the, the hunger problem. They don't. Love of money is the root of all evil. There are wicked people in high places with all the money that could fix all this. But who are the people that are actually trying to make a difference? Look at the people who are going to these starving places and bringing food, Christians. 
all the time, you know. I, I, Where do hospitals come from? Yeah, I get sick of the Christians. atheists that say, <laughs> when there's a natural disaster, this is how Christians help out, they pray. No, look at the list of all the... Um, Humanitarian organizations yeah, they're that are all there, Christian. boots on the ground. All the hospitals, all the orphanages, all this stuff are Christian organizations. Even I saw a meme where it showed, uh, it was a comic of Christians protesting about pro-life, and there's like these orphans reaching out, and she's like, no, dude, that made me so angry because I'm like, how many people actually adopt? How many, they're Christians. How many people are run orphanages? They're Christians most of the time, the majority. They're the ones that care enough. They're the ones that are acting like Christ. You bring up a really good point because there's a lot of very wealthy people in our country and even outside of our country. I mean, Jeff Bezos, you know, you talk about Facebook, you talk about any of these major corporations that literally single-handedly those individuals could almost solve world hunger and they don't? How come people aren't mentioning that? How come they're not like literally going, hey, look, dude, you know, you've got way more than you can even spend. If you spent $10,000 every single day till the day you died, you still would have money in the bank. Like that, that is so much money. What do you need that for? Why aren't we commenting on that? It's like everyone wants to always point the finger at God and say, yeah, but you know, you're not solving this problem. And um, you know, like you, you, you're a parent, if you, if you decide to all of a sudden like, I'm gonna do drugs and my kid's gonna suffer from that, right? You know, is it God's job to all of a sudden just take away those choices that you as a parent made for them? And then, you know what I mean? What does that do for you? And you don't see the effects of that. I mean, there's just a lot of dynamics here with God that he has to allow these. He doesn't want to, but he has to allow them because of, of, of himself being on trial. And yet God is the one who's given most. You know, he is the greatest giver. He is the one that we learn to give from. And so we'll, we'll throw these things out here like, well, God, why don't we do this? And it's like, well, look at what God has done. The, God's goal is not to necessarily make our lives perfect here. You know, like perfect as in material, as in um, we have, you know, no more hunger, no, it, it, you know, he said, uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? And he, and he said in another place, my kingdom is not of this world, right? He is trying to prepare us for the world to come. Yeah. That, that is the, the, the bigger, grander picture. It's, it's like, you know, we're stuck here and we complain about here. And it's like, what, 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 do, is it, what do we have here that we want to hold on to so much? That's, that's worth, you know, I guess, saving outside of people. What's, what's so great, you know? Because we have the sickness, we have the disease, we have all that. You know, the Bible describes Christians as pilgrims. We are passing through this land to a better land. You know, we're on our way to a, a heavenly Canaan. This place is a temporary holding place, right? We're here for now. We make the best of it as, as we're able. And, and the best for others. We make the choice for God. God has, has said, you know, uh, you make the choice for me. And you, what's in store for you is eternal life in a place that is beyond what you can imagine. So. No more pain, no more sorrow. He actually promises tribulation and persecution too. I mean, there's no promise of <laughs> this is going to be easy. And he says, what profits a man if he gains the whole world, lose his own soul. I mean, there's a lot of stuff like that. That, that tells us live for the kingdom, not for this now. Yeah. Yeah. So Marty Sampson's next post um, showed me that he was still grabbing on both sides, and it mm -hmm. really um, brought to my attention how important it is for us to assess why people walk out the church door, because it could be a myriad of reasons, oh, yeah. and that there is a difference between leaving the church versus leaving God. Um, mm -hmm. If you go up to someone and ask them why they left the church, it could be, you know, maybe there was a, a triggering situation. Um, maybe not even in the church, but maybe where the church is located and they just can't show up there anymore. And then they go find another fellowship. You know, helping them through that process, I think will keep more people within a uh, community um, instead of assuming that they've left God. Starting to live a very authentic life now, finally. Not that I wasn't authentic before, but now I am being more wholly authentic to the true me. So here's what's up. I still love Jesus, 
but I am not a part of Hillsong anymore. I still love God, but I do not want to set foot in a church again. Hear what I am saying. It's not that I never will, but right now I don't want to. Nothing wrong with someone else going, but I don't want to myself. Do you see where he's coming from? He's kind of like taking a step back and trying to assess himself, like his mm -hmm. belief, his personal relationship with Christ outside of maybe everyone else and whatever may have been going on in Hillsong or whatever the case, he's trying to be authentic. He still loves Jesus. He's probably still praying, well, at this point in time and still seeking. Um, and it would be great if somebody was there to walk him through that and help him mm -hmm. to keep reassuring that, hey, the answers are in the Bible. Um, I think it's just, it's just so important for us to know why people are walking out the door and not assume mm -hmm. all the time, because they may still be on fire for the Lord. There's just maybe something within the, the, the fellowship. That's the issue. I'm saying that I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life, and I'm grateful to be alive. Grateful to God and to you all for following me. I love you. The future is bright. I will say this, I love everyone that is a part of Hillsong and have zero beef with anyone there. Zero. It's just not for me, and I respect myself enough to tell you all that. God bless you all. You know, I mean, you really have to, to um, hand it to him. He's being honest with the situation. He's walking out and saying, listen, I'm not giving up on God at this point. I'm giving up on this, this, this idea of a picture of Christianity that I've surrounded myself with. And maybe he just needs to like push the reset button, you know, get back to God. Um, the one thing that I would leave someone that is questioning this, and, and I, I think it's, it's, it's for whatever reason, like you said, there's a myriad of reasons why someone would go through this, and it's hard to understand and be in somebody's shoes when they do go through this. But if you're really honest and you come to God and with, a, with an open heart, you say, God, I want to seek truth. Like he's clearly seeking truth. He said he wants to see truth. If you come to God like that, you open your heart to him and say, listen, if, if this is the truth, show it to me and I will respond to it. I believe God will not ignore you. He will put people in your life. He'll put circumstances in your life. He'll, he'll like the Bible says, he will direct your paths to go right or to go left if that's the heart that he's giving to him. And the best place to be is that openness to God. I think the hardest place is I'm gonna close off my my experience with God and I'm going to walk away and then I'm going to try this on my own, I think you're stepping onto dangerous ground at yeah, that point. for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, Simpson told the Christian Post that he had begun to study both sides of the issue uh, of, of this debate regarding Christianity by studying apologists such as William Craig, Jen Lennox, Ravi Zacharias, um, Michael Lycona, and uh, Frank Tarek. Do any of these names sound familiar? Robbie. Yeah, yeah Robbie. Robbie Zacharias does. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> he's probably in this situation where he's read these verses, he's read the Bible, he's seen these things over and over. And it's, you know, it's like you said, he's, he's numb. So going back to that, without putting it in a different context or mindset, is, is probably not going to be helpful to him. And that's probably why he's turned into people like this, because it's like, okay, I've, I keep seeing this and thinking the same way over and over again, like I'm hitting a brick wall. I need help, okay. you know, to, to expound upon that. Like, what does this all mean? How do I understand this? And so it's like listening to a sermon. You read something in the Bible, you, you get to a certain point, and maybe you want to understand it more. You listen to a sermon on it, you get a slightly different perspective and it can help you see things that in the Bible that maybe you didn't see. And so then you can continue to further your study and expound upon that. So I don't know that I would entirely fault him for that. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, I think he's looking for perspective and, and you know, I'm, I've done that myself. You know, you, you understand so far, you want to understand more. Um, sometimes you just, you can hit a brick wall when you're reading the Bible and certainly you should, you should pray through that. Um, but it can be helpful, you know, to dialogue with people who are like-minded to, to get a bit more perspective, you know, kind of bouncing things off of people, you know, we'll do that in, in the office from time to time. Yeah, you know, you're right. I would yeah, agree with that. I think it's helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you guys think about um, studying both sides of the debate as a Christian to actually submerse yourself in the opposite side? Um, atheistic views, evolution and these things, do you think that a Christian should study those things? I would wonder if you're wavering on your faith, 
if trying to run to the argument that is trying to discount Christianity is really a smart choice. It's almost like if you're wavering, like, let me go listen to the reasons why you shouldn't be a Christian, because um, I, I don't quite believe this yet, so I'm gonna set this aside, I'm gonna go kind of surround myself with people who are very strongly against it. I think that's, that's once again dangerous ground. If you're wavering, I would almost want to run to people I respect in the Christian faith, because if you look at it in the whole context, if I totally lose my religion, what do I actually lose? If, 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 if I get to the end of my life and that's it, there's no more, there's really no heaven or hell or whatever like this, there's, there's just nothing beyond it, well, it really doesn't matter if I believe over here, right? But if you're kind of in the Christian camp and you go, wow, I may be losing out on an eternity, if I go to that side of the fence, you know, I'm gonna forfeit my, my opportunity for, for an eternity, I just would not run to the argument. I would run to someone else that, that either has their feet on solid ground or, you know, and really grapple with it. Like, please, I'm having a struggle in this area. Like, you know, give me help with what, what you understand about this. The Bible says a house divided against itself cannot stand. You know, so I, I see that in this situation. If he's truly looking at both sides, you know, and not just listening to people like Ravi Zacharias and other apologists, but he's really going to, okay, what does is, what is anti-Christian literature say about Christianity? I would agree, it's very dangerous, and, and I think it's gonna shipwreck him, and he will not stand, you know, he'll just continue to decline. All right, well, I just wanna wrap this up and also give a word of encouragement. I was speaking to a cousin of mine, and the question came up, are there any Bible characters that may have gone through this same experience of losing their faith? And we thought about it for a while. Does any character come up in your mind? Solomon? I don't know. I, uh, I wonder about Solomon, the ending of his story. Yeah, you know, I think there's, there's definitely examples of some very questionable, prominent people that sort of like, I don't know if they rejected God. They certainly, Specifically, does anyone come to mind? Um, Balaam, you know? Okay. I mean, it's like, you know, here, go curse these people. Well, the money sounds pretty good. You know, it's like he either wasn't understanding the full scope of God, which is hilarious that God let him go, right. you know? I mean, once again, it's like God's like, okay, fine, if you want to go. Then he goes and he actually, you know, blesses the people, which, you know, he was a willing instrument of God, but he was warring with his human, human self inside of that. Jonah, Jonah showing up and, True. you know, like fighting against that. But I, I don't know if I necessarily remember any, I mean, Saul rejected go. God. That name came up. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, Completely. going and seeing the witch of Endor rather than going to God. I mean, he clearly knew. I mean, this is not someone who was unaware of the fact that God told his people to have nothing to do with witchcraft. For someone struggling, wrestling with their faith, I mean, first off, we'd like to tell you that you're not alone. And this has been going on throughout history. The two names that came up in the conversation with my cousin and I were Peter and Judas. Mm. And there are similarities and also vast differences between the two. You look at the similarities, both were disciples of Jesus. They saw him, like witnessed him do miracles. Mm. They called him his friend. They weren't converted. Both of them were not converted. Um, but the difference is one came back to Christ and had a conversion experience, and the other committed suicide. Mm. Both said that they had a relationship with Christ. I wondered what was lacking. Yeah, you know, I always wonder, like, if Judas would have literally humbled his heart and, and said, God, you know, I, I totally see my mistake. Would you take me back? Of course God would take him back, yeah. right? And can you imagine being the only guy in heaven that's like, I killed God, you know, like, what a crazy, like, you know, there's the guy that, like, really, you know, killed our maker. Uh, but the fact that, that both him and Peter denied Jesus, really, yet one came back and the other one thought that he had gone too far. I think that the one that had gone too far, if I can kind of just, on a superficial level, judge what he was doing, he stepped outside of the bounds of God and then really just lost all hope. And when he lost all hope, there seemed like there was no way forward from this point. And mm. I think that's the danger of walking away from God. It is a hopeless world out there if you don't have this, this uh, you know, hope in God helping us through these times. And so, you know, to let go of God and say, I'm gonna just go and float out into the ocean for a little while, I mean. Yeah, is yeah. It, isn't it Paul who says, you know, if, if Christ isn't risen, your hope is in vain. 
like you have nothing if Jesus did not rise from the dead, you know, which is one of the proofs that he is who he said that he was, you know, and that he goes on to, to heaven and mediate on our behalf. But if you had nothing after that, you know, it's like, what else, what else is there? He says, there's nothing. Your hope is in vain. You forget it. Hang it up so on the towel. You hit the, the nail on the head. Uh, the question was, what was lacking? Both had a relationship with Christ, mm -hmm. um, but what was lacking? What did one find that the other one didn't? And there's really two main things, humility and also love, mm -hmm. these two things. There's a formula in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Is that familiar? If my people mm -hmm. who are called by my name, who else would that be? Christians, you know, people who follow Christ. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, yeah, that's the first one, seek my face, sorry, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then mm -hmm. I will restore them. The first step, the most powerful step, is humility. Peter went to Christ and said, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Judas didn't do that. Uh, it was, there was elements of pride in his heart. Judas went to the religious leaders and they weren't able to offer him the forgiveness mm -hmm. and the restoration that Jesus um, can offer. Uh, so that was one area, uh, humility. The next one is love. Peter is then reinstated uh, as part of Christ's group in his, as part of the 11, now 11 disciples, where Jesus asked one question three times. Do you remember what that question was? Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, of course I love you. How could you even ask that question? And I was doing some research into that and it just blew my mind. So in the English language, we have the word love. And it's one word. It means a whole heap of different things depending on the situation. But we have one word, love. In the Greek, there's four words for love. I found that very interesting. I mean, that kind of sucks because we just read the Bible and we say love, love, love. But in the Greek, it's two different words. Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me? And the word that Jesus is using is agape or agapeo. Don't quote me on that pronunciation. You can mm. look it up. But um, Jesus is asking that the definition of agape is to love unconditionally mm. and sacrificially as Jesus himself loves sinful men. And we see that kind of love in John 3, 16. So Jesus is like, do you love me unconditionally? And Peter's like, of course I love you. But the love Peter is using, the word is philio, P-H-I-L-E-O, mm. which is motivated by superficial appearance, emotional attraction, and sentimental relationship. Like I love this apple. Exactly. Wow. So Jesus is like, do you love me unconditionally? And Peter's like, yeah, of course I love you as a friend. And this is exchange is going back and forth. Jesus is trying to get him to understand that you have a relationship with me. You say you love me, but it's the wrong kind of love. It's not the lasting unconditional love. That was what was lacking in their relationship. That is what unfortunately Judas did not find. That was the, the missing link. And the answers came at the feet of Jesus. Um, those are, that's where the truth lies. That's where the, the answer is. That's where you can find what, what elements in my relationship with Jesus is missing. How can I be restored back to my strong Christian faith? Um, so I encourage anyone who is listening, who may be struggling with their faith, um, to humble yourself. Go read 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 7 and also um, John chapter 3. I believe it's John chapter three. Um, <laughs> and, and that was also my prayer for Marty Sampson um, as he is on his quest for truth that he um, find it in Jesus. We thank you so much for uh, watching this episode of LED Live. If you have any questions or any topics you'd like us to cover, leave them down in the comment section below. We're hoping that these kind of topics, discussions, these episodes spark a discussion in your church or in, or in your home. So please share this video to as many people as possible and we will see you next week on LED Live. Bye-bye.